together with the drawbacks of my humble upbringing was one major advantage, voicing an honest opinion, free of the constraints of feathering a noble family nest. I could give sound advice. His Majesty liked that in me. He was tired of the noble sycophants telling him what he wanted to hear. I spoke the truth, though always conscious of my phrasing. I quickly gained his trust and his ear. This did nothing to further my popularity at court. It pleased His Majesty greatly that a change in the law I had implemented gave him ultimate power over the ecclesiastical courts as the only head sovereign lord, protector and defender of the church. The clergy were not impressed. But then I wasn't looking to win their favour. This led to the resignation of the King's Lord Chancellor, close friend and advisor, Sir Thomas More. He had fought passionately against ending His Majesty's 20-year marriage, finally accepting that his cause was lost. It had dawned on him that the final decision would not now be made by the Bishop of Rome. More would not accept the act of succession, nor swear the oath as to do so was to accept the break with Rome. A principled and deeply religious man, he was taken to the tower, joined four days later by John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester. His Majesty was very generous in his appreciation and granted me Lordship of Romney in Newport, Wales, along with other officers, not least Chancellor of the Exchequer in the spring of 1533. These positions did not proffer a huge income, but it was a clear sign to those at court of the high esteem in which I was held. To simultaneously hold positions within the royal household, the chancery and the exchequer was a rather unique situation and one others viewed with envious eyes. By now, His Majesty was in an incredibly happy place, the arms of his beloved new wife. Having played the long game seven years, the Lady Anne had kept him at arm's length. Now finally she got her prize. <laughs> I might not like her, but I had to admit to having a secret respect for her tenacity and strong will. A lesser mortal would have capitulated and all would have been lost. She had promised him a son if he waited until making her his wife. <laughs> Lo and behold, at their official wedding in January 1533, the bride was blossoming, with a scarcely hidden child already in her belly. They had wed in secret the previous November in Calais, and clearly consummated the arrangement. They would have to wait until May to have their marriage declared valid, however. The newly appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, had ruled on both the King's marriages at Dunstable, finding the previous marriage void. As belt and braces, I had cunningly introduced a new bill restricting the right to make appeals to Rome, which had passed Parliament just the month before. Are you beginning to see why His Majesty had me at his right hand? June 1533 was a good time to be at court. It was then that Master Holbein painted that portrait. Let's just say it didn't convey my best side. I'll leave that there. Much merriment, feasting and masks, the Lady Anne proudly showing off her full belly now, she had been crowned queen. Her reward for those long years she had given waiting for His Majesty. Her best years, she would later say. All she had to do in return was deliver her part of the bargain, for the child she carried to be that long-for male heir. Once she had done her duty, she could settle into her role and enjoy all the trappings of life as a royal until the end of her days. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? September 1533. News from the Lady Anne's lying in chamber. She had been delivered of a princess. His Majesty visited her and the child. He was happy both were healthy, but he could barely disguise his disappointment. The celebrations were cancelled and clerks were flat out adding a strategic S to all the pre-printed announcements. She was still young and, as he had said to her predecessor, sons would follow. But
but something in him had changed. The once harmonious accord between the two was now strained. The confident air of the Lady Anne had tilted. She started to resemble more the mouse than the cat. The couple spent less time in each other's company. It was not good news for Chester Jai, who would often bear the brunt of His Majesty's frustration. I was good at keeping my head below the parapet, choosing wisely which battles and causes to pursue. It seemed to work, as my curriculum vitae was now running into many pages. I was pleased not to look to a new position, as it would have meant many nights by candle night with my quill. Just by way of a flavour though, Master of the King's Jewel House, Master of the Court of Wards, Recorder of Bristol, Steward of Westminster Abbey, Constable of Hereford and Bartley Castles, to name but a few. 1534 saw me appointed Master of the Rolls and Chief Secretary to His Majesty. I make no apologies for being a proud father. My boy Gregory was never far from my side. He and I shared a close bond. He had grown into a fine man and one I was privileged to know. With so many plates spinning, you can imagine what an incredibly busy man I was. So I had several clerks in my employ, Ralph Sadler and Thomas Risley. Oh, and my nephew Richard, my sister Catherine's boy. He was a keen, willing and intelligent boy, a little older than Gregory. I was flattered he viewed me as a role model, <laughs> even taking my name though I'm not sure how his mother and father viewed that. 1535, His Majesty tasked me with visiting and assessing churches, monasteries and religious houses throughout the realm, appointing me vice-gerent and vicar-general. He was concerned that the clergy generally were fleecing their following, money-changing hands for so many services. I conducted a census and central register to see the flow of income into these institutions. Of course, this would generate taxation and serve to eradicate the inherent corruption. That His Majesty's coffered need of boost was perhaps a mere coincidence. That July, Thomas More lost his head. His Majesty felt the loss personally and was like an injured bear for a time and best avoided. All More had to do was swear the oath. His wife and daughter Margaret made impassioned pleas to the council myself included, and I was of a mind to support them. But ultimately, it was their unsuccessful pleas to Thomas himself that were to be in vain. The man was to be admired, even if unfathomable. <laughs>